thank you everyone for joining us today to talk about negativity and how to better deal with negativity. I think it's the time of year where there's a lot of negativity. Would you guys agree? No? That's good. You're not experiencing a lot of negativity. Well, I think it's a, it's a time in our society where we're experiencing a lot of negativity more than in past years. Uh, I definitely run into people in my office that talk about experiencing a lot more negativity. And let me just get into a little bit about what I do. I am a licensed clinical social worker. So I have a background in mental health. I am in private practice. My private practice is Blueprint, and it is just down the road. It's uh, over by Meyer in Urbana, across the street from Meyer, across Windsor Road. It's in the Pines area there, if any of you are familiar with that area. That's where I'm located. And I work with a lot of professionals. I work with a lot of professionals to become the best versions of themselves. And in saying that today, we're going to start out with a small activity that I would like all of you to do. So please take a piece of paper that is on your table, and if, we, if you don't have any paper, let me know, or Lindsay in the white sweater there, who's standing up, let her know. You're going to do something really easy. I'd like for you to draw a big circle in the middle of the paper. Just a big circle. And inside that circle, I would like for you to write some intangible qualities about yourself. Intangible qualities. I'm creative. I'm generous. I'm smart. I'm a procrastinator. These things cannot be things that are performance-based. So they, you shouldn't see anything on your paper that says, I'm bad at math, or I'm a good swimmer. These are just intangibles about you. Things that no one can take away from you. I would like for you to write down what happens to these qualities when you are exposed to negativity. Just write a few descriptive words about what happens to these qualities when you're exposed to negativity. And for the purposes of today's talk, when I refer to negativity, I'm referring to any event or situation that induces emotions that fall under the emotion of fear. So I think all emotions can be categorized under love or fear. So to be oversimplified, I'm going to say that the good emotions fall under love, the bad emotions fall under fear. So jealousy, anger, sadness, worry, contempt. What happens to those qualities inside of you when you're exposed to situations that induce those emotions? Would anybody like to share what they wrote down? No takers on that? Oh, okay, I have someone right here. Yeah. Now, I'm going to let you use the microphone. Sure. Thanks. 
I'm looking forward. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm very happy to attend this session. Thank yeah. you for uh, speaking. Uh, so I'm Indu Rupa Sarah from Food Vaccine Incorporated, a research part company, startup company. So um, my uh, intangible qualities, I think I'm friendly, team spirited, and have leadership kind of thoughts, and a more, um, I, I'm a motivator, I consider. And what happens when I face negativity is like I feel, I see it as a challenge, negativity as a challenge. I don't see that in a negative sense, even though I say that as a challenge, challenge can be negative or positive. I see that as a positive thing, so I try to uh, make see the positive side of challenges and overcome them. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Indu. Indu? Yeah. Indu, would you like to give the talk? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> so, so your very growth mindset is what I was picking up on from you. So you see negativity as a challenge, how can I get better, what do I need to, to do here, right? Okay, so uh, when, when you listen to me today, what I want you to listen to is when I talk about giving yourself permission to feel some of the negativity, okay? Yeah. So was anyone else on the other side of this, though? I, I would be. I would definitely be on the other side where I would say that when I'm exposed to negativity, I start to feel like all those good, intangible things that I listed, they start to shrink inside of me. And I start to feel sometimes like if I let that go too long, that they shrink even more and they become invisible. Can anyone else relate with that? Yeah. Yeah. And that's when negativity starts to have us feeling like this, up here. How many of you are familiar with negativity bias? A few people are familiar with negativity bias. Okay, negativity bias is the human tendency to be three to five times more drawn into negative feelings, situations, thoughts, actions, than positive or neutral thoughts, feelings, actions, and things. So it's why when something positive or neutral happens and right after that or right alongside of that something negative happens, you walk away and you're thinking about which one? The negative one. It's why our major news stations play mostly all negative stories because negativity draws us in. I never heard a better story about negativity bias in real life than when a friend that I went to undergraduate school told me when she came in to visit a couple of years ago. And she said, oh, I hear that you're studying negativity and you're studying the effects of negativity on all of us and I really want to get your opinion on something. She's off working in the corporate world now and she has a really good job. And she said, I had my performance evaluation a couple of weeks ago. And in the performance evaluation, my boss went on and told me all these things that I'm doing a really good job with. And then we got to the growth category. And she said, my boss told me three different things that she wants me to improve in this growth category. She said, now, right before she told me those three things that I'm supposed to be working on, she also wrote down a number on a piece of paper and gave it to me, and that number was $30,000. Well, $30,000 was her performance bonus for the year. Yeah, yeah, don't worry, I'm glad other people have this reaction because sometimes I go and speak to groups and I think, oh, it's <laughs> and I think I should have followed all of you and paid more attention to what you're doing because there were years at the beginning of my career that I was lucky to make $30,000 for the whole year, not, not, not a bonus. So anyway, she said that she got this piece of paper and it said $30,000 on it. But as soon as her boss started talking about her growth areas, that number was gone. Now this is a person who comes from a really modest background. Too. 
Her family was, would be considered poor in our society today. They had the government assistance growing up, and so she felt really guilty about not being able to hold on to this number in her head. She went on to explain that throughout the rest of her day, she was working with other people, and she said all of a sudden she would just start sweating, and she would notice that her heart was beating fast, and her thoughts were about all these different things that she was telling herself she was doing wrong. This narrative that she started creating around what her boss said she needed to improve. And she felt very distracted. So then that night, on the way home, she said, well, of course, I picked up my favorite pizza and Oreo cookies and ice cream and went back to eat my feelings. And after I finished eating my feelings, I called my husband and she said, we talked for a really long time about these improvements that I need to make at work. And then she went into the bathroom in the hotel and she was washing her face and she was looking in the mirror and she said, I just went pale white. Because what did she forget to tell him? About the bonus. Yeah. She said, I could not believe that that bonus was so far out of my head and out of my appreciation, is the way that she put it, that I didn't even bring that up to him. And it really bothered her. Now this is nothing unusual for any of us, especially the longer that we live and the longer that we're exposed to negative events in our society, negative things that happen to us, especially traumas and tragedies, our bodies become more enhanced to gravitate toward the negative in our lives. And why is this? Well, it's because our ancestors hundreds of years ago were programmed to protect themselves. They were living in fight or flight situations all of the time where the part of the, ner part of the nervous system that causes us to have a fight or flight response was constantly induced. And all of this has been passed down to us still today, yet we're not living like our ancestors did in tribes and villages. We're living in safe environments, yet uh, our emotional centers of our brains are constantly scanning our environments for threats, seeing, oh my gosh, this person gave me a dirty look, there must be something wrong, and alerting our bodies, right? So what negativity does to all of us is it adversely affects us. But it, what I've learned in working with a lot of people, and not just working with a lot of people, paying attention to myself, because it really was some things that I went through in my own life that got me into studying negativity bias. And I really learned that I'm not, I, I wasn't at that time very good at dealing with negative emotions and negative situations. And then I started watching the people that I work with and our society in general, and I realized no one is good at dealing with negativity. Why is that? Well, number one, it's because our bodies are so programmed from a neurological and physiological standpoint to react to and get drawn into negativity. And the way that that happens is in, th in three ways, really. So I broke this down. I thought, okay, we're not really getting this. I wasn't getting it. I thought, how can I break this down into simplest form? Because that's the way that I can understand things. So I said, what happens to me when I'm exposed to a negative event? Well, the first thing that always happens to me is I'm focusing on, if there's another person involved, the other person. I'm never focusing first on myself. And why is that? Because of the physiological and neurological protective mechanisms that are built into us. We focus on the externals around us to protect ourselves, even when we don't need protecting. So we go through this feedback loop, and it does. It all starts in the body. So physiologically, what happens? So I started training myself. Is it okay? Well, what's going on physiologically with me when I would get into a negative situation? And I would notice, oh, my heart's beating fast, my muscles are enlarging because 
That part of the nervous system that controls the fight or flight, which is called the sympathetic branch of the nervous system, it starts to go into overdrive and it's sending our blood, where? To our legs, to our arms, and our muscles are enlarging, our hearts are beating fast. And then what happens is our bodies are sending messages up to our brains saying, oh, something's wrong here. This person is bothering me. This person always does these things. That he or she's always attacking me or saying something negative to me. And then we get into an emotional tone. An emotional tone that we start to carry throughout our hour and throughout our day if we're not aware of what's happening. And so this feedback loop is something that I think we're drawn into. There's the potential for all of us to be drawn into this every hour of every day that we live. But the problem is we're not aware of it. We're not aware of what's going on inside of us. The other thing that I want to make sure that I make very clear today is that a big part of dealing with negativity is dealing with negativity. And all of those emotions that I said when I first started the talk, which fall under that branch of fear, anger, sadness, disappointment, all, all the emotions that in our society we don't want to talk about. We want to act like they don't exist. Okay? Well, we have to learn how to feel these emotions and learn how to deal with them. We are not here to be happy all the time. Now, we're not here to be angry or sad or disappointed all the time either. But we are here to find a place in the middle where we can effectively feel our feelings, not drown in them, but not feel like we have to avoid them either. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about today is, well, how do we deal with the negativity? Because again, our bodies, they're designed because of the nervous system to either approach, that's that sympathetic fight or flight branch, approach things, get aggressive, or avoid, and that's the, the opposite branch, which is called the parasympathetic, where we shut down, and we become constricted, and we become quiet, and we say we want to just ignore it, and it's just gonna go away. And neither one is really effective in the extreme, is what happens. So we get drawn in, and we're into this feedback loop, and a lot of times we don't even know it. And we can break this down even further because as we go throughout our days, physiologically, this stuff affects all of us. We start to get high blood pressure if we're not dealing with ourselves. We start to gain weight. We start to maybe even take on more serious illnesses. Our feelings are energy. And that energy has to go somewhere in the body. Our body is going to take that on and do something with that energy if we're not dealing with it. The next part, like I said, is the intellectual part. We start getting into our heads a lot, and we start thinking about what the people around us need to do differently, what our workplace needs to do differently, uh, what our society needs to do differently, instead of thinking about who? Ourselves. We have the most power, and really the only power that we have is with ourselves. And last is that emotional tone that I was talking about earlier. We don't even know it, but we start to become more ir irritated, short-tempered. And I always say that use your emotions and the emo your emotional tone as a red flag. When you notice, oh, I am getting more, I'm more easily irritated or I'm more short-tempered than usual. Come back to yourself and say, what's going on? Could I be in this loop that I learned about on Wednesday? because chances are you are in the loop. Okay, it's usually at this point in the talk when I've had people say, you know, I really wish Janice from our office was here at the talk today because every morning that she comes in, she talks about how horrible her son is or how horrible her husband is. And I have to, if I have to hear one more story about Janice's husband, it's not gonna be good. Like I said, we're all programmed to think about the person in front of us or the person on our side or the person behind us and not ourselves. And we really have to work hard to bring it back to us. And so that's what we're going to do here today with these questions. Oh, 
I do it on time. Okay. We're going to go through these questions, and I'm not going to ask you to answer the questions out loud. I am going to have you do a small activity after we get through the questions. I'd like for you to think about which question resonates the most with you, and as we go through the questions, I want you to also be thinking about that loop that I talked about earlier. The physiological, the intellectual, and the, mo the emotional. And think about which part is most prominent for you. Not for your partner, not for your mom or your dad or your kids, but for you. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a few minutes and I'm going to go through a series of about five questions. One thing I do like to say about this one is negativity, when it goes unchecked, it usually does spiral. So it starts spiraling and becoming larger and it's contagious and we start to pass it around too. So usually it does go into other parts of our days and we pass it on to other people in our lives. Uh, when, when we're dealing with negativity and, and it goes unchecked, oftentimes what happens is our stress hormones really start to flare and people can, can see that in us when we're not even feeling it in ourselves. So there's a certain look to it and also a lot of research has been done that shows that there's even a smell that goes along with very high stress. Now what I'd like you to do is take that piece of paper that you drew your circle on and I'd like for you to turn it over, please. And on the back, I would like for you to draw something like this. Just a, a little silhouette person. This is not art class. As you can tell, I'm not good at art. Maybe I can have one of the Pixel people come up and uh, do a different diagram for me for my next talk. Just do a little self-diagram. I'm not going to make anyone share this, but I am going to ask for a volunteer. Now what I would like for you to do is think about the question that you resonated with the most. The one that you thought, oh yeah, that you felt in your gut, said, yep, I do this, and I do this every time it comes up. And I want you to think about where you experience the negativity in those situations. So I want you to draw in, for example, when I experience anxiety or worry, my heart starts to beat fast, my muscles start to tighten up, I start to get a lot of thoughts in my head. So I want you to just to draw in some symbols of what happens to you when you experience one of those situations. And then at the top, next to the head, I want you to write down thoughts that go through your head. Are they thoughts about the other person? Are they thoughts about you? And when we go through this feedback loop, like I said, we always take on an emotional tone then. At the bottom of your paper, I'd like for you to write down the emotional tone that you take on.
Okay, is there anyone brave enough to share what they wrote or drew? Yes, in the back, all right. My name is Lonnie Naharo, I work at Pixo. This is my profile, and when I experience the negative emotions, it's usually here and up here. <laughs> and then the things that I think about, I'm a very introspective person, so I don't ever think, oh, these people need to change this, these people need to change that. I think, man, I suck. Oh, I can do better at this. So it's always, what did I do wrong? It takes a very, it takes a lot of times before I'm like, no, this is somebody else. This can't be me all the time. And then I usually feel defeated, panicky, or anxious. Thank you so much. Very good. Anybody else like to share? Oh, all right. Again. Yeah. 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 Yes. So, yeah, since I started, like, just wanted to do uh, before. So, uh, when I see the negativity, um, I first thing I see is like um, the effects of that negativity, what will be the outcome of that negativity. And then I try to find ways, I take time, I know it hurts, it did, it does hurt, I'm a human, so everybody gets hurt, and I try to see um, how to avoid those negative effects, and how to override them if I can, and, and like, even, and make it over, like I, I just generally speak up. <laughs> yes, you can. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing again, too. Yes. How many people found this hard to do? Yeah. It's hard. It's really hard. And it's hard because we don't like to think about these things. And we don't like to look at ourselves. And a lot of times in our society, we can, we can get really far without looking at ourselves at all. Now, I think we hurt a lot of our human connections along the way when we do because our relationships around us are only as good as the relationship that we have with ourselves. So if we're not dealing with ourselves and we continue to avoid ourselves, then we really are in some way or another avoiding those around us too and really attending to their feelings and their thoughts and their needs. This stuff is not easy though. And if you're uncomfortable, that's a good sign because it means that you're doing some work in here today. This stuff isn't supposed to be comfortable and that is a part of learning how to deal with negativity. If we're comfortable dealing with negativity, then that means that we're probably not really dealing with it. Okay, so everyone understands the feedback loop? Makes sense? Yeah. How many of you think that uh, you go through the feedback loop several times throughout the day? I, I know that I do. Yes. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Yeah. Like I said earlier, it wasn't my profession that really prompted me to start studying negativity more heavily. In 2006, or 2005, my dad was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. And my dad was the person in my family that I had always been the closest to. We had a, a really good relationship. Um, he was somebody that, even if I wasn't talking to all the time, just in my head, I knew that he was there and that I could, I could always go to him and talk with him. And when he was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis, uh, does any, anyone know what that is? Anyone familiar with it? No, it's, it's a pretty rare disease. And so basically what it is is the, the lungs fill up with fibroid tumors and you end up suffocating. And there is no cure for this illness. So my family knew right away that this was going to be uh, terminal and that we weren't sure of a timeline. And to say the least, it was a really stressful time in my life and in my family's life. 
And at the same time, I was moving, relocating here to Champaign-Urbana, and so I was changing a lot in my life, and I didn't have a very strong support system. And my dad ended up passing away in 2006, and when he passed away, my family really went through a lot of turmoil because he was the glue that held the family together, not just my immediate family, but my extended family as well. So there, there was a lot of grief, uh, there was some trauma, and there was just a lot of loss at that time in my life. And I quickly saw that I was going to need to take some time away from my job. I, like I said, work with, as a therapist every day and a life coach with other people. And I wasn't in any shape to focus on other people. I needed to take care of myself at that time. And I went to therapy. I worked on myself. I actually went and worked at FedEx Ground and unloaded trucks and loaded trucks. I, I now know that I had that desire because I was carrying a lot of this grief inside of my body and physiologically I was wanting to get some of this out. So that's why that seemed very appealing to me because I had never worked at FedEx or any other shipping company in the past. Uh, so I did that for a while and I started to create a community here, meet people, and started to form a life here. And about a year later, I did go back to work and start working as a therapist again. But I had a friend come to visit me, and it was a friend that I went to graduate school with. And she said, I know you've been through a really difficult time in the past couple of years, but I still think when I'm around you that you're focused on a lot of really negative things. That's what you're most drawn to. And while that was really difficult to hear, at the time I knew that she was right. And I thought, okay, I'm doing all the things that I know to do. I'm going to get help and I'm working again and was exercising at the time regularly. So I thought, I think I need to do something more. So it was right around the time when social media was becoming popular, and I thought, okay, why don't I open a Twitter account? I'm gonna call this account Good Things, and I'm gonna go out and try to find 10 good things a day and post them on this account. Well, if any of you have ever tried to find good things, 10 is like overly ambitious. That was so unrealistic to do, okay? I, I, I don't know what I was thinking from going to sitting on my couch a lot and uh, not doing a lot of proactive things to, oh yeah, I'm gonna go out and find 10 good things and post them on this account. So I, I quickly learned that I couldn't just wait for these things to cross my path or I was never gonna have this 10 every day. But I'm pretty ambitious and I really like challenges. So I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make this happen. Well, what it made me realize was our habits in our daily lives are closely linked to our mental and emotional and physical well-being. And I knew that about exercise and eating, but I did not realize that as much about our mental and emotional well-being. There's a saying, and I don't know who, who came up with this saying or where it originated, but feeling follows action. And that is so true. So I started deconstructing my days and looking at, well, how do, I, how do I spend my day? First of all, I noticed that I was reacting to a lot of things. That I was waiting for people to contact me. And I was waiting for a problem to solve. Or I was waiting for a newspaper or some news source to read. And I realized I have to go out and start making things happen, especially the good things in life. And so I started getting back into some of my old hobbies that went by the wayside when I was going through all of the turmoil with my family. And so I started every day then getting up and looking for good articles online just to share. I thought, I'll just start my day like that. And then it transformed into, I'm going to look for some cool pictures to take. Or I'm going to look for some good music to share. And it became really fun to find other people's art and other people excelling at their craft and sharing their things and hearing from other people, oh, I really liked that and that made my day and seeing the effect that it had on the other people around me. But what I also started to realize was that I was going 
from one end of the spectrum, like I said earlier, I had drowned in that negativity, and I was going to the other end of the spectrum and only looking at the good. And that wasn't realistic or sustainable either. And so I had to ask myself, really, where do I want to be in all of this? And I sat down and I just listed actionable values. So it was, I want to be in my present moment. I, I, one of my intangible qualities is creativity. I want to do something creative throughout my days. I love connecting with people. I want to do something to connect with people. And so I wrote those things down because I knew that they were going to bring me fulfillment. But I also wrote down, feel my feelings. Because that was something that I figured out through all of this I was really struggling with. I would either avoid them or I would drown in them. And I wanted to find that middle space. And so what I realized also was that all of us need that unique space in the middle to be okay, really. That it's not the same for any one of us in here. There's a quote by one of my favorite authors, Sharon Salzberg, and she says, the further we get from reality, the more we suffer. And I like to say, and add on to that quote, that the further we go, both positively and block out reality, or negatively and block out reality, the more we suffer. It's not all one or the other. Re reality exists in the middle, and it's a skill to learn how to hold both, the negative and the positive, even in the most tragic situations. Because when I looked back at everything that I went through and watching my dad with his illness, I still enjoyed some of my last days with him playing checkers or sharing old stories. And those were really good things, even though there was a lot of sadness at that time, too. And I've also realized that I was going throughout my days just waiting to get to the next what I thought was good thing, but not really ever being there. And so I started really looking at habits. And I saw that most of us go from that negativity loop. Me, I, I was doing this. We go from that negativity loop that I had up there, the physiological, the intellectual, and the emotional, and we're uncomfortable and we're, because we're in pain and we don't know how to deal with our pain. And so what happens is we, we, we want to release that pain, so we jump into some kind of habit that will release it. Well, if we're not conscious, it's usually some kind of bad habit that's just going to help us numb out. So it's, oh, I'm going to pick up my phone, I'm going to scroll through social media, or I'm going to go and just have a drink, something to just relax, or I'm just going to zone out. And what happens is we're craving that release, and, and immediately we get that release. We get some immediate feelings of relaxation. We get those, those dopamine hits in the moment of the bad habit. Okay? But then, after that dopamine wears off, what happens? Which loop are we back in? I am not doing a very good job if no one knows this answer. <laughs> yeah, we're back in the, in the first negativity loop. We're back feeling either fearful or worried, and then what we do is we jump right back into usually another bad habit. So the key is, number one, awareness, learning, okay, I have to start being aware when I'm in that first loop. And what I figured out was I have to start creating some sustainable habits. When I say sustainable, I mean habits that are going to bring me sustainable good feelings throughout my day. And the first one that I got into was meditation because that was going to help me be in my moments and, and or increase my self-awareness so I was aware when I was leaving my moments mentally. And it's in these what I call your white habits that 
help us to really find that fulfillment and that place in the middle of the balance that was up there earlier. That place that isn't all good or all bad, but somewhere in between. And it does, it takes a lot of introspective work and a lot of being with ourselves and dealing with our pain. And when I say pain, I mean just even the little bits of pain that pop up throughout our days, the little bits of discomfort that we all either want to kind of run at and push away or constrict and shut down and shy away from. But instead, it's about learning how to face all of it head on. And that's really where the self-awareness comes in. There's a really good researcher out of Harvard, and her name is Susan David. She has a really good book out called Emotional Agility. I highly recommend this book. And she talks about how when we learn how to get in touch with what we're feeling on a regular basis, what we do is we activate a part of our brains called the readiness potential part of the brain. And that part of the brain is linked to goal setting and goal achievement. And it helps us to know what we really want and how then how to get what we really want. There have been a lot of studies done recently in our society on just self-awareness in general. And so what a couple of these studies, they've, they've been out of Harvard as well, what they've done is they've had uh, participants write in their journals about uh, different things that have happened throughout their days. And then they've had them give the journals to another group. And so the other group reads the journal about what's happening. And then they talk to uh, the group that wrote the journal and then the group that read the journal. Guess who was better at predicting what, those, what each individual writer felt? The people that read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, again, we're so accustomed to putting the focus outside of ourselves and avoiding our feelings. And so as a result, we oftentimes don't, number one, know what we're feeling and we don't really know what we want. And that's why feelings are so important and they cannot be disregarded in order for us to lead fulfilling lives and what I would consider then successful lives. We need to start winding down here today. I have a lot more material. If any of you like this talk and you want more material, uh, Lindsay is over here. Uh, she has some of my cards. I do workshops. And I do other talks at businesses. I do a lot of individual work. But I would like to leave a few minutes for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please raise your hands. My name is Sabrina Scott. I work in um, business career services. So earlier you mentioned um, actions follow feelings. And what immediately came to my mind is kind of fake it till you make it, but people kind of view that negatively. So it, do you see those as kind of being the same type of thing? Not necessarily fake it till you make it, but kind of like projecting your thoughts and letting your thoughts kind of lead. Is that the same type of Thing. Am I asking the right question? Well, yeah. so, okay, I just want to make sure that uh, I didn't say the wrong thing because I meant to say feeling follows action. That's okay. That's okay. So, feeling always follows action. We're not going to think our way to a better place of feeling ever. So, if you're sitting at home and you're feeling really negative, then it's good to get out and go for a walk, change your environment. Uh, go be around people that are good for you. Okay, so now, do you want to ask the question again? No, I cut it backwards. Okay, so I'm going to say what I think about the fake it till you make it thing. I think that works only to a certain degree because I, I, a lot of the work that I believe in the most is all about being true to yourself and knowing yourself, okay? Uh, we live in a world, though, where when we go through hard times, we can't take our hard times with us and present those hard times to the world. So we do have to put on some kind of a mask. 
And, and I do think that that helps us uh, some of the time. But I think we have to have spaces in our lives where we're able to then go and say, you know what, I'm really struggling with this. And we can be our authentic selves. I think that it's most important for us to be able to be our authentic selves more times during the day than not. So it might look different in a professional setting. So you might, I think it's better to go in and say, you know, I'm really not that good at this than it is to go in and act like you know all of it. Yeah, and I think we're going to see that whole principle start to die, the fake it till you make it. I think that in that era of leadership is really going by the wayside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Anyone else? My name is <coughs> My name is Sam. I'm working for Caregiver. Uh, I'm curious how you do meditation. I'm sure. Um... Mm -hmm. yeah, great question. I meditate with the Headspace app. And I also use 10% Happier. Uh, I've, I do some walking meditation also without an app. Um, I started out just doing two to three minutes a day with Headspace. Uh, it was an app and a voice on the app that really resonated with me. But for me, it is all about just paying attention to my breathing and coming back to the breath. And when I realized that I didn't have to try and organize my thoughts or stop my thoughts, that really it was about growing that observer part of myself, uh, that's when it all became more attractive because I, I always thought that, oh, if I sit down and meditate, I'm never going to be able to do it the right way because my thoughts will just run wild. But that's okay. Does anyone else in here meditate on a regular basis? How do you guys meditate, if you don't mind sharing? Thanks. Um, I use just like random YouTube videos to do a guided meditation. Um, yeah, usually just like 15 minutes. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you. See, I told you we were going to get to talk today. <laughs> So I, well, I am a born Buddhist, but now I am a Buddhist uh, because I, I agree with that philosophy. Um, so we were trained to meditate, like as, as kids. So how now how I will meditate is like it's so busy, you have no time to spend. So when a thought comes, I just meditate. I mean, I was meditating even now. Like you can meditate like a couple of minutes or five minutes, ten as 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 you have time. So I take that is kind of choosing solitude in a way and think yourself and figure out how to find answers yourself first. If you have questions, ask others. So that's generally. It, it, it can be seconds or minutes or hours, like, yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's right, we can do a lot of mindfulness practices in our regular days. One mindfulness practice that I like to use is every time I walk through a doorway, I just do a check down on my body. Say, so what is it that I'm feeling right now? What do I feel in my neck? I go to places that I know I always carry stress. So I go to my neck and my shoulders, I'll say, is there any tightness there? Like, what's happening? Where am I holding my tension today? If you attach any kind of practice like that onto something else that you do all the time throughout your day, you're much more likely to make it a habit than if you try to just you know, set that time aside individually. Any other questions or anything anyone would like to say? All right, well, thank you very much. You guys have been a great audience. I really enjoyed being here with you today.